So welcome all of you to this study of Shichin Gyaltsap Rinpoche's uh, The Great Medicine. And um, the, the topic of what we're going to be discussing here um, is sort of at the heart of everything we do in Buddhism. It's really, uh, it's not particularly that we in Buddhism are onto, you could say, the truth for the truth's sake. It's just the reason why the Buddha taught is because we suffer. So it's not that the Buddha really would be seen as God or a prophet, but rather we refer to the, to the Buddha as the great physician. And the reason why the Buddha taught is to alleviate our suffering. So that's really, you could say, it lies at the heart of the Buddha's teaching. It's simply to address the issue of our suffering. Um, so once again, I'm just going to check if the, everything is okay. And I'm going to switch off the, um, switch off the video then. So we can focus on the, the subject matter at hand. Good. I might switch it on for the Q&A. All right. So, um, oh. so the, um, so the great medicine, um, is on to this thing that we cling to the notion of reality. And uh, the reason is that because of uh, us being delusional and believing in a non-existent reality of self and other, this duality, this triggers off suffering. So it's not that we're wrong or we're bad at our science or whatever. It's just that we're stuck in this painful condition. And also the suffering of samsara is not something necessary. It's not that we were created to suffer. It's not basic to us. It's, you could say, extraneous or external to us. Our basic condition is not imbued with suffering. And that's actually quite important for some of us 20th, 21st century inhabitants of the modern world to realize the basic disposition of any sentient creature is not delusional is not to suffer and so in his awakening the buddha saw that we are we are st we suffer due to a reason and that is a delusional fixation which perpetuate this endless suffering now the thing is we we sort of are stuck in a circle in a vicious circle of suffering and it's driven by basically ignorance not knowing or delusion and this drives a neurotic pattern that is associated with this self and these neurotic patterns in turn they drive our actions and on the basic of these actions then we have these habitual patterns in which we suffer so we are going to address this situation so this is a very practical text and um, it is about practice. So a lot of us, we're already students of some great teachers. We're practicing and studying. We're, we're studying and practicing the Dharma. And uh, this kind of advice, this is going to greatly enhance our understanding and clarify the path. And this then will enable us to practice with much more motivation. So we're in the company of some great masters, and we're going to share their vision so that we, like them, can be uh, guides to others, that we can guide others to enlightenment. So the great medicine that conquers clinging to the notion of reality, this is steps in meditation on the enlightened mind. So what we're going to have here is an overview. It doesn't matter what kind of practice we're doing. This gives us an overview of the nature of the path. And the teachers here, this lineage, Shichin Gyalsab, Dilgu Kensa Rinpoche, and Rabja Rinpoche, uh, are then our, our guides.
Now, Shichin Gyaltsev was a great master. Um, he lived in the 19th and 20th century. And um, his full name was Shichin Gyaltsev Gyurme Pema Namjal. So we sometimes see him referred to as Pema, Padma Vijaya, which is his name in Sanskrit. And um, he, in addition to being one of the principal teachers at the Shichen Monastery in Eastern Tibet, which was one of the great six great Nyingma monasteries. Um, he also um, was a teacher of Dilgu Kenzo Rinpoche and um, Jamyang Kenzo uh, Chogi Lodra, Songsa Kenzo, the previous Songsa Kenzo. And um, we have we have thus, you could say, a lineage from the author himself directly to Dingo Chenzerimbuja, directly then to Dingo Chenzerimbuja's uh, not only, uh, you could say, um, heir in a physical sense, but also spiritual heir, Shichin Rabjerimbuja, who together with Tsongse Chenzerimbuja, Jigmi Chenzerimbuja, Kyabje Chulchi Chenzerimbuja was his direct student. So we have a very immediate lineage, you could say. And uh, this particular teaching was then is then comes from uh, Rabjam Rinpoche teaching this in Bodh Gaya um, in the year 2000 and also in the US in 2002. We have Matthew Ricard, who's very capable uh, translator, who translated the root text. And then we have Anijimba, who translated then the tapes of the lectures itself. So we have the root text, which is the verses, you see them interspersed in the text and they're also in the back of the book. And then you have Rob Jambridge's commentary in prose. So we, uh, we'd want to appreciate the sort of the purity of this lineage. And um, Matthew also tells this um, story of when uh, Ken Jambridge, he received one of the texts of Shichin Gyalsat that, um, that had been thought to have been lost, um, sort of, I took this and with tears in his eyes, he held this to his forehead and said that this writing is more valuable than all the gold in the world. And uh, uh, Shichin Kyalsop was really Rinpoche's principal teacher together with the previous Tsongsikens of Rinpoche. So uh, what we have here is uh, exceedingly uh, valuable. Now, in the introduction, um, we speak about the value of pure perception. And um, Rajam just speaks of, um, he gives some examples here about seeing Bodh Gaya. If you've ever been to Bodh Gaya, uh, sometimes one is overwhelmed by the sort of external um, aspects, uh, particularly around the stupa. <laughs> and one tends to overlook the, the uh, one could overlook the profundity and the purity uh, of the stupa itself. And, um, and also he tells the story of, um, of um, the, the daughter of, um, of Dingo Chenzo uh, sitting. We call it Semo Tsiring, meaning the, the daughter of a great teacher, who was actually then Rob Jambuja's aunt, but he never got to meet her because she passed away very young. But anyway, this pure perception is really important as we're receiving some teaching. So we'd want to really appreciate this teaching as being uh, exceptionally um, valuable. Okay, so um, so we we'd want to um, you could say in some sense um, to really appreciate the heart and what lies uh, really at the core of these teachings. We'd want to um, be free from what we could say our projections and some of our habits, and this is why we before teaching we emphasize the. Um, the value of motivation. Um, and um, also there's some uh, advice on, so there's basically advice on generating motivation and also of seeing the, the purity of the present context. And also then there's some advice on uh, avoiding unhelpful um, conduct. 
But in brief, what we're talking about here is generating the mind of bodhicitta, wishing to establish all beings in enlightenment, as well as something we call the five perfections, which is really um, just a question of uh, pure appreciation for uh, where we are. Um, the context, the time, and so forth. And then finally, then, some advice on how we could uh, receive optimal benefit. But like I said before, Rav uh, he speaks a bit about the, um, the nature of being in Bodh Gaya, and uh, this is where he initially taught uh, this. He says, to the ordinary eye, Bodh Gaya may appear to be a dirty place full of garbage and not especially pleasant. But if we consider that it represents the seat, the seat of Lord Buddha's enlightenment, Bodhgaya takes on an altogether diff different dimension. With this understanding, we can begin to see it differently. So this is really applies to not just Bodhgaya, but wherever we are right now. Somehow in the, you could say, the uh, chaos of our karma, we're actually sitting um, studying something exceedingly valuable. So we should consider that the circumstances here are not ordinary, that there's something uh, intrinsically extraordinary and pure about what, where we are and what we're doing. And likewise also, um, Kenzo Rinpoche, he spoke with um, Samo Tsering, his daughter, and was asking her, he says, he says, don't you find, actually this is when um, they were visiting also a place that probably had its fair bit of litter, which was around the, the Samya temple. In, um, in central Tibet. Um, Tibetans, they, they would sort of have the habit of chucking their garbage out of the window. And that's kind of not such a problem because most of it would actually be organic waste. So in those days, it wasn't that bad a problem. But there was also things like dust and so forth. And um, his daughter, Dingu Chen's daughter, was doing prostrations all the way around the, the Samya temple. And so he says to her, don't you find it difficult to do prostrations here? Don't you feel disgusted? And she, this is the daughter speaking, and she wouldn't have been very old at the time. Oh, it probably says in the text, I forget, but she would have, you know, been, been very young. And um, suddenly I can't find my book. But anyway, as she was doing this uh, prostration, Kinsar Mbuchi asked her, um, wouldn't you find this, didn't you find this place disgusting and dirty? And uh, she says, um, when I think that Guru Rinpoche actually visited this place and that the ground I'm doing prostrations on is the very place his precious feet touched, I feel as like if he just walked by and the earth is still warm with his footprints. I don't feel and notice anything else. So the implication here is the pure vision of Semotering and the value of this. Um, now, now, then there's this, the quote that I put in here in this particular slide. Uh, and this is about developing the motivation of bodhicitta. So I thought we could just read this together where Ken Zimbaji, he says, this is on page 12 in the book, he says, All sentient beings, without exception, whose number is as vast and limitless as space, and who have been our kind parents in the past, aspire to happiness and wish to avoid suffering. Yet, afflicted by ignorance and mental poisons, they ignore the causes of happiness. Contradicting their aspirations with their actions, they suffer from all kinds of torment in samsaric existence. They are like blind people abandoned in the middle of a desert. When they were our kind mothers, they gave us life, provided us with food, clothing, protection, and education. Seeing their unhappy condition now, we cannot but help feel great compassion. Yet the mere feeling of compassion is not enough. We must actually do something to free them from suffering. Now that we have obtained a human existence and met a spiritual teacher, it is time to progress towards enlightenment solely for their benefit. So this is in essence, what we call generating or cultivating the mind of bodhicitta, which is this compassion, this active compassion in the sense of wishing to uh, alleviate the suffering of all beings and now having the means to do so to persevere in that this path. So that's the heart of what we're doing here. Now, 
we'd want to be clear that even though everybody's very busy doing all sorts of actions that as far as the various actions that we have in this world um, they're all based on this clinging to a self me and mine it's so it's still operating within a delusion and as like Rinpoche says even though we want happiness due to our delusion due to our uh, afflictions and neurosis driven by this clinging to a self we continually perpetuate our own suffering so we'd want to be aware how we strive to be happy and yet fail so this is humbling and the practice of Dharma needs to be preceded with this recognition and it also generates compassion all sentient beings do this and they suffer immensely and even in the context of Dharma and Dharma practitioners, they might also be perpetuating um, further suffering. If they're not actually free from their ego fixation, um, then they very often are just continuing ordinary confusion and sometimes even justifying their actions with some sort of Dharma righteousness, they might also perpetuate suffering. So we want to be um, aware of this. There's two kinds of suffering Robin Rinpoche speaks about here. And one is the outer, which we have very little control. This means things like outer uh, catastrophes, uh, death and suffering and so forth. And these we have very little control over. But there are the inner conditions that we can operate with. And this is our attitudes in regard to these circumstances, how we react. And so whatever teaching we have, these are all about remedying the root causes of our suffering, which is ignorance. So whatever it is in Buddhism, it all comes down to eliminating this ignorant fixation about a self. So there's lots of and countless branches of teachings that remedy these um, this illness, this uh, neurosis, clinging to the self and grasping onto its projections. So it's important that we don't just want to liberate ourselves from this um, condition just for ourselves, but really taking all sentient beings into consideration. So we're, you could say we're onto the most basic cause of all suffering in the universe. So this is no, you could say, trivial minor undertaking. So we want to really, um, uh, you could say, value um, what we're doing. This is why we value the Buddhist teachings. This is why we value Buddhist masters. And also in terms of our own prioritizing, we want to value the practice of Dharma. Like I mentioned before, we have these five, perf five perfections. And this is really the context in which any Buddhist teaching uh, takes place. If you look at any of the various sutras, they all start off display um, discussing how the Buddha, he was teaching so and so and this and this place, and this is what he was teaching, and this is the time, and so forth. So we have these five perfections of teacher, students, teaching, place, and time. And the motivation that we bring to this is then the um, this motivation of um, bodhicitta. So, in brief, um, and this is what we talked about before, we also want to combine this with a particular style of listening to the uh, teachings. Um, you could say this is a way to optimize the way that we actually hear. So this is just going through. This is from Rab um this is from Rob Jimbridge's introduction. So he, he talks about something that you find in many Buddhist teachings, which is the famous three defects of a pot. There's the upside down pot, where we're listening, but we're, we're inattentive. So if you pour something onto a pot that's upside down, nothing goes inside. This is a metaphor for us being inattentive. And then there's the leaky pot. We attend the teaching, we catch a few things, but it leaks out. So that's not remembering properly. And then there's 
a pot containing poison. So if we have a poisoned agenda with the teaching, for example, we might want to listen to the teaching so we can go out and become great gurus and make a lot of money and so forth. Um, that's, you could say, a poisoned agenda. And also in general, if we're in an agitated state of mind, then the teachings, um, they don't really sink in the way they're supposed to. So this is the um, one aspect of the conduct of listening. And then also we have something called the five ways of not retaining the teaching, uh, which are then we um, retain the meaning, but not the words. And so we miss important aspects. We sort of get a vague idea, but we actually miss a lot of um, detail. So then we might get uh, have all the detail, but then again, if we don't grasp the meaning, then again, we're missing something. Then if we have neither, then we're in trouble. We're not getting anything out of it. And then again, we could recollect both words and um, meaning, but then we might misinterpret them. So it's subtle. And then we could mix up the sequence of the teachings. We then lose the clarity of the sequence. And um, this could result in some confused ideas. And then finally then, Coming back to these five perfections, um, we'd want to consider here what we have comes from the teaching of the Buddha. So there's a sense that the, the essence of the Buddha is present. Um, we have a noble lineage, uh, holders uh, who, of the teaching, who were like the Buddha himself. Um, then we have uh, their teaching. Shichin Gyalsab and Rajarambujas, the Dharma. And likewise, also, uh, here we are attending. The retinue here is actually all of us uh, who are studying this particular text. We'd want to appreciate these as the future Buddhas. And also, we'd want to appreciate that we live in a particularly fortunate era, the age in which the Dharma has been taught. This is not to be taken for granted. It's not always that will have an awakened individual teaching. And even if this person were to teach, it's not sure that the teachings are upheld and so on and so forth. There's a lot of different conditions that need to be present. And then finally, the place. However, we might want to view the world. We'd want to appreciate this world is exceptional in that the Buddha's teaching has flourished here. So all of these Keeping in mind the motivation of bodhicitta, keeping in mind the attitude of the five perfections, keeping in mind um, the conduct, listening um, without being inattentive, not forgetting, and not having a poisonous agenda, as well as the five wrong ways of, of um, not retaining the teaching. All of these actually are important because when we have this, when we really have this from within, we have what you would call optimal conditions for rece receiving and uh, absorbing these teachings. So we should um, have these, and also we should generate great joy. Uh, if we have great joy in hearing these teachings, this enables the openness to hear the teaching, to retain them, and also to integrate them. So the the teaching itself, it has something that you very often see in Buddhist teaching. It has a virtuous beginning, middle, and end. And this is kind of um, different from a lot of the things that we are fascinated with in this world. We very often are fascinated with something in the beginning. Then it kind of becomes habitual. We don't really care too much about it. And then finally, it just breaks down and is useless. So this is very different. The Buddhist teaching is, from the very start, it's something that is you could say, a cause of joy and a cause of um, liberation. So we talk about the, the value in terms of something being virtuous um, as being this, you could say, value is present right from the start. And it proceeds through the middle and throughout the end when we attain perfect enlightenment. In this particular context, we are talking about then the uh, beginning of the text, the middle of the text, and conclusion. But all of these, they have this value of bringing uh, happiness and liberation. 
and this then we use the word virtuous. So here then in the first chapter we have the uh, introduction to the text. It starts off with um, just Rajan and Bajir discussing Shichin uh, Gyalsap, German Pema Nambyal, and um, we we um, we have I think there's a life story of him actually written by Alex Zenka. I haven't read it, but anyway, in brief, a few things that we should say about him is that he was a student of the three Jamkins. Jamkin, uh, these are Jamkin Zawangpo, <clears throat> then also Jamkin Kontrum, and then Jamkin Mipam. And particularly Mipam Rinpoche's works were very much uh, sort of upheld by uh, Pema Namgyal. He was like his really close uh, lineage holder. So he was immensely learned. He's someone who wrote a lot. I think we have 13 volumes from his writings. He was a great master. Rav Rinpoche describes how um, Shichin Gyalsab went into retreat for three years and came out after just a few months having achieved uh, accomplishment. And um, they actually found a rock where he left his footprint. If you go to Shichin Monastery, um, this rock with a footprint is still there. And then, moreover, Shichin Gyalsab was the teacher of Dilgo Kenze. It's the one he was the one who recognized and enthroned Dilgo Kenze Rinpoche as the incarnation of Jiang Kenze Wombo. And he was also the guru of Tsongsa Kenze Chogilodra. So the text itself, the title is The Great Medicine That Conquers Clinging to the Notion of Reality, Steps in Meditation on the Enlightened Mind. So it starts off with the Sanskrit, and this you very often find in Tibetan text. It's simply just an expression of the respect the Tibetans had for um, the Indians. And it's also an expression of how the Tibetans only validated uh, the Buddhist teaching on the basis of it, whether it existed in India or not. So the sort of popular belief that Tibetan Buddhism was mixed up with um, indigenous aspects um, is uh, sort of an urban legend. Um, there's some of the practices you could say that have taken on a distinctly Tibetan aspect and flavor in some way, but the core of the teaching is only validated to the extent that it actually uh, is authentically uh, based on a lineage that comes from India. So hence this, you could say, um, fondness for everything Indian and for, and hence you also find this Sanskrit in uh, all the homages in the various texts. So Namo Guru Buddha Bodhisattva means basically homage to the gurus, the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. So the text itself then begins, I bow to all the masters who have attained supreme primordial liberation and out of compassion remain here, dredging the depths of samsara. So as far as the, um, um, the teachers go, uh, here in the context of the Vajrayana, um, they are seen as Buddhas. Uh, in the Vajrayana, the um, teacher is seen as embodying the all the Buddhas, and we say that the teacher is extraordinary in being equal in wisdom to all the Buddhas, and um, being far superior to all the Buddhas in terms of kindness, because the teacher is actually here with us. So while the teacher's wisdom is, you could say, in sync with all the Buddhas, then the kindness of the teacher is far superior. Um, the teachers of the past, we didn't have the karma um, to meet them. And so as far as we're concerned, the kindness of our teachers far superior to any uh, Buddhas of the past, however glorious they might be. Also, we want to remember this thing that one often says, that the blessing we receive from the teacher is, is proportionate to our attitude. So if we see the teacher as a... Um, spiritual friend, then we get this kind of teacher blessing. If we see the teacher as a bodhisattva, we get the blessing of a bodhisattva. And if we see the teacher as um, someone who is the Buddha himself, primordially 
enlightened Vajradhara or equal to Padmasambhava, then this is the kind of blessing we receive from the teacher. Um, we'll just have a break here. I'll see if there's any Q&A. Um, so let's see if there's any questions here. I'd just like to say, if any of you are having technical issues, then like I say, um, you probably the best is the best you can do is to um, call the the 800 number there. Um, I I put a link in, so you should be able to um, to get uh, technical uh, help. So, just checking if there are any questions about the text. No questions so far? Okay, should be clear then. Okay, that's good. Then we'll just continue. And also I'll do some, um, I'll stop before we finish and do a QA and a at the, at the end. Okay, see you later. Um, So here we get down to what is the um, the objective of the text. And Shichin Gyalsab, he writes, I will speak a little bit about how to destroy one's clinging to the notion of um, reality with the great medicine bodhicitta, the essence of the Mahayana path, the road traveled by all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So, um, the most important um, aspect or the, more, the core of what we're going to be teaching here or studying here, um, the medicine itself is bodhicitta. And we say that while the students such as the Arhats and the Pracheka Buddhas, they all depend on the Buddha, then the Buddha himself the full, you could say, full enlightenment, perfect enlightenment depends on the presence or absence of bodhicitta. This we also find in the uh, introduction to the middle way, the Majami Kavatara by Chandra Kirti. And this is the point he makes in the first, uh, in the opening lines, actually. Um, the bodhicitta is the root of all the bodhisattvas' enlightenment. The thing is, our illness is this belief in a self that's alienated to the sense of other, self and other. And so we believe in a self of person, and we also believe in a self of phenomena. Basically, you could say we believe in a solid self and a solid, uh, you could say, objective reality. And the medicine here, what uproots this is wisdom, which uproots, you could say, in the absolute sense, the insight that cuts through this delusion, and compassion, this caring for others, which uh, on a conventional level enables us to free ourselves from just the mere focus on ourselves. So what we want to bring to this is then this uh, wish to free all sentient beings from suffering. So the need for this teaching. So the first is then what we had before with the author's intention. And you have this actually at the beginning of uh, any uh, Buddhist text, uh, certainly in the Indo-Tibetan tradition. First there's the, what we call the homage. And then there is the, the, te the teacher. Um, he describes what is his intention or his commitment in terms of writing this text. Now then comes the need for the teaching. You say why? What is the purpose of this teaching? Well, it is for our purpose. And this is particularly then addressing then the students. He says, keep this in mind when in dire straits upon the vast plain of clinging to life's appearances, surrounded by, by your enemies, the obscuring emotions, you are about to be robbed of the supreme 
wealth, which is virtue. Um, should have been an M dash there. The um, supreme wealth is this virtue. So that's the best thing we have. So right now, we have we are in dire straits in samsara, clinging to the self, and as we do that, clinging to me and also clinging to the solidity of me and my projections, what we call this life's appearances. As we're lost in that, then we continually are surrounded by these enemies, which are our neurosis centered around me and my relation to my experiences, my projections. So these are the enemies and they're about to um, rob us of the best we have, which is our sanity, our clarity, our wisdom and compassion. So we are vulnerable, we are easy prey, and the robbers are ignorance and obscuring emotions. Obscuring emotions is one of many English translations for the Sanskrit klesha, uh, the Tibetan nyanmong. And nyanmong actually means something that intoxicates us. But the implication is this, this, these emotions or these obscuring emotions, klesas, Trungpa Rinpoche calls them neurosis. Um, Jeff Hopkins translates it as afflictions. Um, the basis of all of this is really that it's the strategies of our clinging of our self. It's everything that's sort of centered around me and all the affliction of that. So this originates in this clinging to a self. And on the basis of that, as we know, we have countless likes and dislikes. It's constantly referring back to me. Do I like this? Do I dislike it? And this in terms re re results in these obscuring emotions. Then we have all the various um, afflictions such as being attached, being obsessed or disliking something. And to the extent that we are angry or uh, even hateful. Likewise, out of that comes things like pride and jealousy and so forth. So on the basis of that, what we have then are what's called the eight worldly dharmas. These are our continual concern about eight things, eight ordinary practices, which are whether we have gain or we have loss, whether we are famous, have a sweet reputation, or perhaps not noticed, obscurity, whether we have pain or pleasure, whether we are praised or blamed. But all of this we can sum up in terms of two essential aspects that operate on the basis of this clinging to the self, which is hope and fear. And these then are the enemies that we need to be um, attentive to. For after everybody, he says that what continually happens to us is that we lose it on the basis of that. We are continually distracted, a bit like um, he described going to Times Square and just being overwhelmed and bombarded with all the lights and the impressions that you have when you walk on Times Square. And likewise, even in our ordinary life, there's continually things that uh, do that we're distracted. So we, <clears throat> we'd want to look at what can be done uh, about this. So this is where we then come to the main chapter, the main, the, sorry, the main part, the main teaching, what is then called the, the middle section of the uh, discussion, what is called virtuous in the middle. So this is chapter two. And this is where we begin with identifying what is this bodhicitta. And this is, um, you could say, comes with a tremendous sense of trust in who we intrinsically are. Uh, in describing this bodhicitta, we begin to um, first uh, identify what this uh, nature of who we are, the, how it resides within us, and how we then could train in this, and what is the outcome. So there are these three moments or three aspects, identifying bodhicitta, training in bodhicitta, and the result of practicing it. So the first verse is really about the big picture of understanding the, um, the nature 
uh, of who we are. And we could say that is the common ground of uh, ourselves and the Buddhas. This is the common ground of uh, Buddhas and sentient beings. And here Shichen uh, Gyalsev, he says, all phenomena remain in the expanse of beginningless time. And since this is the case, all sentient beings can achieve nirvana. Just as there is perfectly clear water within the earth, within the obscuring emotions, there is great primordial wisdom. So the ground, all sentient beings without exception have uh, Buddha nature. Um, it refers to this common ground that we are uncovering through the path. It's the, you could say, the <coughs> our working um, our, our working basis. And this is where you could say the Buddhist the Buddhist teaching is exceptional because it's not as if the Buddha he taught from the point of view of him being superior. It's just that he was no longer afflicted with delusion. But we can see how when we are um, when we perceive someone who is delusion, delusional, uh, it's not as if we see them as being inferior. For example, if we hit uh, next to someone having a nightmare, we don't feel that they're kind of uh, uh, inferior to us. We just appreciate that they are undergoing a delusional condition in which we can see that they have this um, experience. So we, they have our full um, <clears throat> sympathy. But it's not as if we look down on them. Likewise, also the, the you could say the basis for the Buddha teaching is not that the Buddha looks down on us, but just realizes that our Buddha nature is is obscured. Just like someone who's having a nightmare, it temporarily is having this. We also have it when, um, <clears throat> for example, someone is perhaps ill, having fever, and on the basis of that are having some hallucinations. We realize that they're just due to particular conditions, they're obscured. So this is where the Buddha's uh, teaching is coming from, this recognition that sentient beings, they intrinsically are pure. Um, and we'd want to appreciate about this nature that it's not something that is, um, that is, uh, you could say, it comes and goes. Just like someone who is hallucinating or somebody who is, is um, having a dream, it's not as if they're changed. It's not as if their basic nature is corrupted. And this also leads us to recognize that the nature of enlightenment is never um, sort of improved on enlightenment. When someone wakes up from uh, a dream or a nightmare, it's not as if their person as such has been improved. It's just that they're no longer kept or um, held, caught up in, the, in this particular experience. So you could say the, the, all the Buddha's teaching is this great medicine that is uh, intended to unveil this natural innate uh, health, this natural innate uh, purity. And so regardless of whatever teachings uh, we have, this is their objectives. So it says the sutras that elucidate emptiness and all the words spoken by the victorious ones, meaning the Buddhas, all speak of getting rid of the obscuring emotions. So again, obscuring emotions here refers to the basic ignorance as well as all the neurosis and affliction that arises out of that. Now, when we say all the various teachings, this refers to all the sutras, the, the Vinaya, the, um, the Abhidharma, and so forth, the words of the Buddha, as well as all the commentaries, all the commentaries we have from great masters like Nagarjuna and Asanga, all the Upadeshas, all the great masters that we've had down through uh, the the um, the ages uh, Vashubandhu the great Siddhas Tilopa Naropa Padmasambhava Longchenpa Jetsongkhapa Sakya Pandita the Kamapas and so forth all these great masters have all given these upadeshas which really means uh, pith instructions 
So all of these teachings, they all address this illness of clinging to this to the self and the product of this clinging to the self, the obscuring emotions. And we need to recognize that however, um, however deluded we are, this Buddha nature remains untainted. Shichin Gyalsa writes, Buddha nature is immaculate. It is profound, serene, unfabricated suchness, an uncompounded expanse of luminosity, non-arising, unceasing primordial peace, spontaneously present nirvana. So, We'd want to appreciate that the Buddha nature is not something that is constructed. Enlightenment is not constructed. So, as such, there's nothing about it that could come to an end. This is innate abiding reality, and it is endowed with all the supreme qualities, such as we say it's peaceful, it's something innate or profound, it's something that is unfabricated, it's not something that's constructed. It's an, all, it's an uncompounded expanse of luminosity. It's um, great bliss and so forth. So we continually operate with the recognition of the qualities of enlightenment. Also why when we meet Buddhist sages, we're drawn to them because we can see how these qualities are manifest. The joy, the wisdom, the compassion, the um, abilities and so forth. Uh, these Buddhist masters are impressive. So this abiding nature, when we unveil it, is not something that is constructed. It comes as something that is um, possesses all these qualities, and yet this nature is something that is unceasing. It's not something that sort of comes and goes. So <clears throat> we appreciate this uh, Buddha nature as something that is spontaneously present, meaning it's uh, unconditional. So um, this is then you could say the um, ultimate nature of phenomena. It's the ultimate nature of subjective phenomena and it's also the ultimate nature of um, what we perceive as ob objective phenomena. So both subject and object, ourselves and our world. So we say that this nature is just as sesame seed pervades, ses sorry, just as sesame oil pervades sesame seeds. The essence of the Tathagatas is primordially present and inseparable from the basic state of all beings. So we say uh, Tathagatagaba pervades all beings. Um, it's something that is all, always present within us and it's something that there's not a single being that doesn't have this so it doesn't mean so it doesn't so, so so it means that there's not a single being that doesn't have this it's the basic state of all beings and it is and you might as well get used to some buddhist vocab here it's dharma ta it means it's the suchness of phenomena it's actual reality so this is something that never exists apart from us. So this nature, um, it might be obscured temporarily by deluded notions of subject and object. We might temporarily, and this is where we go into um, talking about the uh, 12 links of dependent arising. When we begin to have this delusion, we begin to talk about these Pratichya Samudpada, the 12 links, that is really the cause of samsara. So this, all of samsara, we can say, really just comes from this uh, innate delusion. And we are obscured by this delusion. We say, obscured by the deluded notions of subject and object, shrouded in the cocoon, of the three habitual tendencies, like a treasure lying hidden in a poor man's house. This nature remains unrecognized. So we here are then beginning to discuss, on the basis of this Buddha nature that we all have, then there is 
the temporary condition of delusion. This is a workable, this is a, a condition, it's a curable condition, but we want to identify how does it come about. So <clears throat> we particularly um, want to first be clear on the fact that as much as samsara seems to take place, right, it is a delusion. And a delusion means that there's actually, it's just a figment of subjectivity. It's a figment or an experience of a consciousness. It's a hallucination. It's not real. And so even though nothing actually takes place, then of course, to the one who is deluded, just like we look at someone having a nightmare or a hallucination, um, although nothing actually is taking place, it does seem to the one who is deluded that there is something that is solid, real. Someone who is caught in their dream, yes, they are experiencing um, their own person being subjected to various experiences. And so perceiving a solid self and solid objects, this then drives likes and dislikes within a dream. We are attracted to objects, we are repulsed by um, other objects and so forth. And likewise, us in our experience, we have this, you could say, self-centered notion of reality and with that uh, all the various likes and dislikes and this then becomes clashes and karma. And on the basis of these clashes, or you could say neurosis or afflictions, then we have then various actions. We, for example, we like something, and then we establish this as mm, desirable, and then we do something about it. We go and get it. And then once we have it, we cling on to it. And so the, this initial delusion of me, that comes then with the package of me in relation to the objects, the likes and dislikes, this then becomes the various styles of emotional attitude and that then drives our actions. So we have then these patterns that um, come from our delusional condition and these habitual patterns that then evolve, they particularly result in what we call the perception of a world which is the deluded notions of subject and objects, which create a perception of the world. We have a particular sense of the world around us, each and every one of us. So we react with likes and dislikes and with these various habitual patterns of our emotional attitudes and our actions, we spin this uh, cocoon of delusion and suffering. So these, this is how we then interact with the world. And also then we similarly also have various uh, aspects of our consciousness. Um, we have first the world and next consciousness where we have the basic ground of our consciousness, which is, you could say, really where samsara begins. This is what we call the alaya or the alaya vidnana, which really just means the all ground. This is the basis of everything that exists. It's the basics of our ignorance. And so on top of that ignorance then, where we have the sense of me and object, then we have our perceptions all around us. We have these perceptions of me perceiving sight, sound. Right now you're hearing me, you're looking at a screen. That's sight and sound. And likewise, you might be smelling something, you might uh, have various kinds of perceptions. All of these are stand in relation to this basic sense of me. And so this in terms then drives the various likes and dislikes and our actions and so forth. But all of this then comes back to uh, something that feeds this sense of subjectivity, this sense of me. So that's consciousness. And finally, as part of the package is this sense of person. All of us sit with an individual body. 
I can't feel what your bodies are feeling. We each come with our private experience of our individual body. And so this is part of what we call the five skandhas, the five experiences of a person. And this is the first skanda, the skanda of form. The Tibetans, or rather the Tibetan word for body is lu. And Rabbi Ramachir explains this means actually what's left behind. And this is then the physical shell that we abandon when we, um, when we die. This skanda of the, of the physical skanda is left behind. Um, so this physical form is then what we call uh, the body. And um, this exhausts eventually just like anything else in our being. Our consciousness is continually undergoing exhaustion from one thought form to the other. So the other aspects of the skandhas, they continually undergo change. And this particular aspect of the skandhas, our physical form is no different. Eventually it exhausts. So that's why we have this big deal around death. So as we cling to the body, um, then we very often have various forms of happiness and suffering uh, in relation to our physical experiences. So anyway, these three are very important to us. Our experience of realm or world, consciousness and body. And this essentially is how we continually uh, perpetuate existence as samsaric individuals. So all of these habitual tendencies, they accumulate on this alaya, this all ground consciousness. And this is from that we have then our experience of samsara with the initial delusion clinging to the self, and on the basis of that, the kleshas and karma. Then Shichen Gyalsab, he says, Obscuring emotions and wrong actions cause sufferings to fall upon us like rain. Since beginningless time you have roamed on the immense plane of existence, which is apparent yet unreal. Alas, such is the power of ignorance and karma. So these three habitual tendencies that we discussed before, they accumulate impressions on the alaya, on the all ground. And in the way that we um, perpetuate these um, um, emotions, karma and kleshas, uh, they continually bring about um, suffering. We are continually experiencing this relating back to the self, and this brings about our suffering. But the thing is, as much as this takes place, and we have, yes, admittedly, a very vivid perception of uh, our body, our realm, our consciousness, and so forth, none of it, if we look, actually has any reality. So this is the important point. This is the whole aspect of, you could say, wisdom or vipassana. Um, prajna, that if we look, we see through appearances. So this is what we will do with the path. This is the cure that enables us then to see that these assumptions around self and what it produces, these various forms of habitual patterns, they have no reality. So we begin the path with this examination. We look, is this for real? And this is, as soon as we begin to look, we actually begin to intuit, you could say, absolute truth. We begin to dismantle our delusion. If we look at something that seems solid, if once we look at it, we see it's a composite. We look at something as if it's enduring. We actually look and we see, ah, oh, it's not going to last. All of this is, you could say, part of the gradual path of uh, awakening. So now we get around to the remedy, which is then the how to be free of delusion. And this is where Shichin Gyal Sabhi then says, having fully prostrated at the lotus feet of an authentic master, you should cleanse the stains of ego clinging with the nectar of his instructions. So we're concluding this chapter then with the um, basically um, presenting what's going to come next, with his, which is the discussion of the path. The path itself requires that we have somebody who actually guides us, 
And here we need to be discerning and we have to look for a teacher that has qualities such as wisdom and compassion, someone who's free from destructive or obscuring emotions, who's free from ordinary agendas. So the student needs to be skillful in finding a teacher and in attending the teacher and also in becoming aware of the teacher's wisdom and then applying the teacher's instructions in practice. Now, if you look in Zar Paltrumbridge's Words of My Perfect Teacher, um, in the pr preliminary section, there is an entire chapter that's devoted to identifying and uh, how, identifying a uh, teacher and also instructions on how to attend such a teacher. So once we have that situation, we then need to apply ourselves uh, to eliminating obscurations as if we were removing stains from a cloth. The thing is here that these, the, what is going to remove these stains is the nectar of the teacher's instructions. So we're going to, in the next section, be discussing then the uh, foundational reflections, taking refuge and generating bodhicitta. So that is um, just very briefly on the first sections of Shitting Gelsap's The Great Medicine. So if there are any questions, um, please ask. No questions? All right. Well, this is wonderful also because the... Um, the text itself really is very um ah there are some questions okay <laughs> how to see disasters as illusion um this is where we talked about earlier um we talked about the outer the outer forms of suffering that we see um, we can't do much about them but what we can do is the conditions uh, sorry, we can't do much about the external conditions, but we can do something about our attitude. So, yes, there are uh, air crashes, earthquakes, and so forth. There's every day we look in the news and we see disasters all around. So as far as these disasters go, the external disasters, we can't necessarily do much about them. We can, of course, try, but we very often see we fail. And in general, we can say there are continually disasters that we can't, you could say, um, secure ourselves or protect ourselves from. But what we can do in our personal lives, in our immediate experience, is work on the attitude with, how, with which we receive these disasters. So that's where you could see there's a big difference between a sage, how a wise person handles situations and how ordinary people like ourselves handle situations. We very often are irritated just with small irritations and we notice how a sage can actually handle great um, difficulties. And so we'd want to appreciate that what we're dealing with here in terms of this the great medicine is taking medicine with regards to the the subject, the one who is the recipient of the various conditions. And that's where we can make a difference. So, of course, also what we can see is when we look around the disasters in the world, um, for example, the cruelty that, that takes place. If we look at how did some of these cruelties originate, this actually comes from, right, we can trace it back to subjectivities, individuals who have strong sense of self and strong sense of other. And on the basis of that, then with this alienation, then there is this, you could say, all these poisons that come with the sense of self aversion, attachment, greed, hatred, and so forth. And this then is brought into the interaction with the other. And so we have crimes, we have wars, and so forth. But all of these we can trace back to the original source, which is this uh, afflicted or poisoned sense of subjectivity or poisoned sense of self. And that's where we can also see the value of undertaking what we're doing here. We can't you could say remove the hallucination of the others. And likewise, we can't remove the 
the afflicted mind we can't change the afflicted minds of others they're caught in their particular illness their particular you could say um, neurotic or um, diseased subjectivity but what we can do ourselves is begin to be free of delusion and so that's where you could say we can see the value of what we're doing here both in terms of handling the circumstances around and also understanding when we see the you could say afflicted subjectivities in the world around us seeing that what we're doing here is actually addressing the illness right at, at its root so then um let's see if there are any other questions so and also this of course is understanding you could say the the um as we can understand in terms of ourselves and this also enables us to generate compassion for others even those who are inflicting suffering on others who are in perpetuating crimes or whatever aggression uh, we can realize that they're also stuck in their particular uh, hallucination so from the primordial some, someone asked then from the primordial oneness why do sentient beings arise what is our purpose in being here? Oh, that's the biggie. But the, the, you could say the very core of this is a moment of delusion. So we talk about the primordial oneness um, being something that we mistake. What happens is that this in, within this primordial oneness, there is what we call display or its own power, the, um, the arising of manifestation. And where the, you could say, the primordial Buddha is enlightened and where sentient beings, they wander in samsara, is at the point where when this display manifests, the Buddhas realize that this is just my own display and hence are free, while sentient beings, they take it as something else, an object. This is just like when we're dreaming. We might realize that we are dreaming and hence we actually within the dream we're free in, a, in an extraordinary sense and but if we're caught up in the nightmare we suffer so you could say our purpose in being here is to awaken from that we possess innate goodness we possess innate wisdom compassion clarity and all of that and you could say our purpose is to unveil this also our population ex <laughs> Our population is exploding. Where do all these sentient beings come from? And are animals sentient beings? Yes, animals are sentient beings, of course. And all the various beings, uh, the population is exploding? I don't know. Um, we're really just talking, saying that from a, you could say, uh, anthropocentric viewpoint, uh, from the point of view of humans. But, you know, you just need to um, sort of, have some particular conditions come together on, on a, in a particular place and all of a sudden you see the animal population exploding in one regard you know um, ants all of a sudden might have favorable conditions then their populations are expanding and then again we might have climate change it won't be long until the human population is diminishing so all of this coming and going these are just various experiences of various sentient beings Um, and then someone asked, define reality. Yes, this we already done. We started off defining uh, reality as, well, there's clinging to reality. Um, that's when we cling to solidity. And this is what we are trying to address here, our clinging to a solid self. So uh, that is where we are delusional. And we could say we assume something is real when it's not, just like when we're in a dream. So we assume there's a reality there. But then we might have someone who, maybe if we have someone who's helping us, maybe someone whispers to us, uh, try and recognize your dream. Then we are no longer caught by this clinging. And that's where you could say we awaken then. And, to, and that we can then call actual reality. That's where we're no longer delusional. So, so we talk about delusional perceptions. And we, unfortunately, are, as sentient beings, we cling to these delusional perceptions as real. And this is what we want to get rid of. We want to penetrate this delusion. 
That's where we want to dissolve clinging to reality. And in doing so, you could say we arrive at actual reality, true reality. The term dhammata came up, phenomena as they are. So that, you could say, is absolute reality. So you could say we have two truths. There's the truth of relative reality, and then there's the truth of no longer being delusional, which is absolute reality. So we talk about two truths. Okay, um, we've gone a little bit over time here. I hope that's all right. And um, if there are no more questions, I think we'll conclude. So thank you very much for um, participating um, in the webinar tonight. And um, predictably, the homework, um, ah, what is it again? The homework is for, oh, sorry, ah. for next time, read chapters three and four. So that's for next time. And then we'll conclude with dedication and also uh, a small aspiration uh, some of you might be familiar with to cultivate this mind of enlightenment. So by this merit, may all attain omniscience, may defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness and death, from the ocean of samsara, may all beings be freed. May bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. Thank you very much. Good night.